let's uh, let's go ahead and get this out of the way. Just because, just because. You can turn to your spouse and say, I love you. I'm counting for you. Get this out of the way. And you can turn to your spouse, your loved one, and say, I love you. It's Valentine's Day. I'm counting for you. Here we go. One, two, three. I love you.
Father God, we thank you again for another day that we're allowed to step into your house free. We're going to worship you because you're worthy. We thank you for the mercy and grace and the love you show each and every one of us. We thank you for that sacrifice, Lord, that we come to hopefully never take for granted. Those thorns that were beaten into the soil, those thorns that were meant for us. That sacrifice that tore the veil, Lord, that allowed us to come to one and one and have the relationship that every one of us needs and has to have. The sacrifice, Lord, that allows us to worship you freely. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for your son and his, his uh, mercy and grace on each one of us to come to this world and to take our cross, take our blood, take our cross. Lord, we ask that you be with us as we go through many trials in this earth, Lord, and, and we know the mountains are tall, are tall but we also know that they be climbing with Jesus Christ and our Lord. We pray your healing hands be on each and every one here who paint, and who's not here today, Lord, and, and just be with us, God, and we'll bring them back home. In Jesus' name. Father, it is good to be in your house today. It is good to be here with like minded believers. It is good to know that you are there when we have to climb those mountains, but you're also there when we get to those valleys. Father, please be with the messenger this morning. He continues this series. Lead us, guide us, give us strength, give us wisdom, give us the courage to face the obstacles we face in this life. Father, most of all, we thank you for the Jesus Christ who came and died on the cross for our sins. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Can I interrupt here just a minute because I have no one? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, quickly.
Wednesday, a couple of announcements. Number one, I got to see mom in person this week. Mom, or Dad and I went over and got to see mom. She is at Johnson Mathers in Carlisle, and she's doing great. Uh, she's very content, very happy, very healthy looking, looks well cared for, and she, and she, and she has friends now. And if you get to talk to the people at Johnson and Mather, she's a handful. <laughs> Which is not a surprise to many of us. But anyway, I just wanted to share that with you, that Mom is really doing great, and Dad actually got to see her in person. One other thing, because I have the mic. <laughs> I am still looking for a few people to help mow. I have most of the summer squared away now, but it's like uh, March, April, August, March, April, Uh, and I have a couple of people that's going to take one of those and will probably pair them up. And if you know somebody else and you want to do it with somebody, let me know. We can do that. One last note. We have a mower. So it's not like you have to provide your own mower. So if you'd like to help, we would love to have you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Thank you, Bradford. Um, Jonah Smith's class can be dismissed at this time. As they're leaving, uh, we have passed out some ballots. Uh, those of you who are members that would like to vote uh, on Jim White to serve as deacon, we're also going to be announced we're going to vote next week. Uh, but we wanted to go ahead and get those out today because it's really kind of a week by week thing, the world that we live in. And so since you were here, uh, you can go ahead and vote today if you want, or you can wait until next week. Uh, those of you who are watching online have been contacted, and you can either vote uh, by sending me a message via Facebook or email, or we can send you a paper ballot. We would need to do that soon if that's what you would request, as long as it can be back by next Sunday. And for those of you who have those, if you want to give those to an elder, uh, which would be Wendell or Chris or Gordon, who's sitting up there with all of his friends this morning, uh, you can do that today, or you can just put it in the offering plate at the top of the steps uh, when you, as you leave here, and we'll get those one way or another. What? You can mark them in blood if you want. That's to go ahead and do that. I'm sure that would really help the spread of this. Thank you, Bradford. Happy Valentine's Day to you too. I don't really mean it, but happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Yes, it is. I think parents, more than anybody, uh, understand the importance sometimes of tough love. Uh, good parents, I should say, understand best that sometimes the most loving thing you can do may not be the most popular thing to do. Parents understand that there are times you have to do something that's not going to be well received by your children, and I'm not just talking minor children necessarily either. It is not the, the most popular thing sometimes to tell your six-year-old, we're going to limit your sugar intake for, for this month. That's not the most popular thing with your kid, but it is the most loving thing for you to do. It may not be the popular thing for you to say to your, to your teenager, you're not going to wear that out in public or you're not going to watch that movie, or you're not going to stay over at that person's house, or I'm going to take that phone away if your grades don't improve. Those things may not always be popular, but they might be the most loving thing to say at times. Your adult child, who's still regularly depending on you for money, it's not going to be a popular thing for you to say to them, I'm cutting you off. You need to take care of yourself. You're, we supported you for a long time, but you need to provide for yourself now. You, that's not going to be the most popular thing for you to say to them, but it, it is the most loving thing. Sometimes the most popular thing and the most loving thing are two completely different things. You can do the most loving thing to somebody, but they may not receive it very well. And so that's what we're going to see today as we continue this series that we started last week called Paths. 
We are studying the New Testament letter of 1 John, and throughout this letter, love is going to be an overriding, predominant theme. Love is always going to be the source of what John has to say in this letter. But understand that what John writes out of love may not be received very well by some people. It may not be well received by those who hear it. Everything John's going to say in this section today is rooted in love. It comes from a heart of love, but what he says isn't always agreeable in nature. It's not always pleasing. It's not necessarily what people want to hear. It's loving, but it's not necessarily popular. Now, here is what is happening that causes John to say what he is going to say. And it's really not just what was happening then. It's also what's kind of happening in the church at large today. There are people who are saying, I'm a Christian. In fact, I go to this church over here. But then their lives aren't reflecting the things that Jesus taught. And that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing for that person. It's not a good thing for the church, frankly, because it is a poor reflection of Jesus. When we say to the world, yes, I'm a Christian, yes, I follow Jesus, but then we call somebody on Facebook a moron because of who they voted for. When we say we love Jesus, when we say we love the church, but sports tend to determine what we do on Sunday more so than Jesus or a love for his church. When we say that we've been saved by grace, when we say that our sins are forgiven, and then we continue to spew hatred towards somebody who has done wrong to us. When we say that Jesus is Lord of everything in my life, but a quick glance at the bank account reveals that maybe that's not exactly true, that he's not the Lord of how we manage our money. That's what was happening when John wrote this letter in 80 to 90 AD, and it's still happening some two millennia later. Something else that was happening then and is still happening today is that there were new Christians, there were first generation Christians who put their trust in Jesus, they received his grace, but then they immediately found themselves at a crossroads. They have two different paths that they can choose from. One path would be the path of Jesus, the only true path, but the other path would be what we would call a worldly path. And many of these new Christians were saying, yes, I believe in Jesus, I'm on this path, but in reality, the way they were living is they were living on a worldly path. And so John wants to be crystal clear, and he wants to mark out some of the paths that they know as new Christians. Here's the path Jesus has called you to, here's the path the world is trying to lead you down. Two, distinct, two distinctly different paths. So with that in mind, look at what John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so first things first here, when John uses the word world here, he is not referring to people. In John 3, 16, when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one only son, world there was talking about people. For God so loved people that he gave his one and only son for them. But here in 1 John 2, he uses this word world, and the idea here is, is a, a worldly way of thinking. It's worldliness. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If you do, he says, then the love of, of God the Father is not in you. If you say you love God, but in reality you're really living for the things of this world, then God's love is really not in you, he says. You don't really love God. If, if you're living for, if you're passionate for all these things in the world, the world's values, the world's stuff, the world's way of doing things, those things are in direct contrast to what God offers and what values and God's way of doing things. And so John is just making it clear here that there are two different kinds of paths. There is a path of following Jesus. There is, there is a path of worldliness. You have to choose, he says, which path you're going to take. Now, I tend to think that John was kind of inspired to write these words from what Jesus had said in the Sermon on the Mount toward the end of that message. You might remember in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talked about two different kinds of paths. He said that there's a narrow path that leads to life, and there is a wide path that leads to destruction. The wide path, he said, is broad, and it's big, and it's the, it's the most crowded of the two paths. Jesus said that that's the path that many people will go on. It's the path that many people will choose, but he says it leads to destruction. It leads to eternity in hell. But 
But then he says there's this narrow path that has a narrow gate, and it's not nearly as populated as the wide path because Jesus said only a few would travel that narrow path. They would choose that narrow path. So Jesus speaks there about a narrow path and a wide path, and John kind of builds on that idea here. He says the narrow path is following Jesus, the wide path is worldliness. And so the question for us as we study this today is very simply, what path are you on today? What path are you pursuing? What direction are you going in life? What signs are you following? Are you following the path of worldliness? Or are you following the path of Jesus? So that would be the challenge for us this morning, to, to just stop and to think for a moment and to ask, what path am I on right now? Because here's what I think. I think there are some of us that just assume we're on the narrow path. Because that's the path we chose however long ago. That's where we started. And so that was our intention, to stay on this narrow path. But something happened. And along the way, we've gotten distracted. And we find ourselves saying that we're on a narrow path, but living like we're on the wide path. Several years ago, I went out shopping for a new television. This was when the flat screens first started to make, uh, were starting to get popular. And so I was in Sears at the Florence Mall shopping for a, a big screen TV. And I was looking at all the different televisions they had. And this employee ended up coming and talking to me. And I asked him some questions and we talked a little bit. I had not really studied much about those televisions at that point. So I asked the guy, I said, just, who makes, in your opinion, who makes the best LCD televisions? And without, without thinking, he said, Sony and Samsung make the two best LCD televisions. So I nod my head, look at a few more televisions, and then he says to me, yeah, I'm getting ready to buy one myself. I said, well, are you going to get a Sony or are you going to get a Samsung? He said, oh, I'm buying a Vizio. And I said, but I thought you said that Sony and Samsung were the best. And he said, oh, they are the best. And I just, I kind of stared at him for a little bit. And we ended up buying this Sony that was a really good television, but we didn't buy it at Sears and Florence. You know, I think that guy gave me accurate information because of the other places I shopped basically shared the same information, that Sony and Samsung make the best televisions. So I think that that employee gave me accurate information, but it didn't reflect his own personal experience. Probably because his commission check would be larger had he sold me a Samsung or a Sony. And I think for a lot of Christians, we can give people the right information. I think we can give people accurate facts about our faith. We can say the right things and provide factual information as it relates to Christianity, but what we say is not reflected by what we do. We started out on this narrow path with Jesus, but somehow we've ended up over here on this path of the world. We're told, speak the truth in love. But we speak with anger, hatred, animosity sometimes. We're told to forgive others, to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. But we hold grudges and we retaliate. We're told to submit ourselves to governing authorities. But we mock them and we ridicule them. We're told to turn the other cheek. But love, let me tell you, if you come after me, I'm going to come right back after you. Know the right things. Say the right things. We just don't always live the right things. We have a hard time staying on this narrow path. You know, Jesus condemned the religious leaders of his day and he said of them, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are where? Far from me. And so John addresses this mentality of what path are you on? Where is it leading? Would you stop for just a moment? Would you stop and just ask yourself, what path am I traveling today? What does the evidence of my life say about the path that I am traveling on? And so what John does here is he gives us some road signs that kind of mark the wide path of worldliness so that we can recognize that we are on it. Look at how he does this in verse 16. He says, for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has done, 
It comes not from the Father, it comes from the world. So John gives us these, these three signs of worldliness. Cravings of sinful man, lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has done. Some of you may have learned this uh, verse years ago, like I did from the King James Version of Scripture, where it talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But John says these three signs mark they tend to mark the wide path that leads to destruction. Now, to help us to remember them, to help me to remember them, I, I, I'm just trying to capture these three signs with three words that all start with the same letter. Pleasure, lust of the flesh. Possessions, lust of the eyes. Pride, which is when we make ourselves the center of everything. John says these are the three road signs that tend to mark the path of worldliness. But notice, in and of themselves, those things are not inherently evil. Two of them especially. I mean, God has given us a gift of pleasure. God wants us to experience pleasure. He has given us food. He's given us sexual pleasure. He's given us all kinds of outlets for entertainment. But when that becomes the path that drives your life, when that is what you think about when you get up in the morning and when you lay, to bed, lay, lay down and go to bed at night, if pleasure is what drives you, then you're no longer following Jesus. You're following pleasure. Pleasure has become this false god or this idol for your life. Possessions can be wonderful blessings from God. But when the material things of this world become the things that we live for, when they are what motivate us and get us going, that becomes the path that we are traveling, this, this path of worldliness. And there's a word here that John uses that's an interesting word. It helps us to understand when something goes from being a gift to being a God for us. It's, it's this, in the Greek language of the New Testament, it's the Greek word epithumia. Epithumia. Which translates here into English, lust. What the, what the word in its original language literally means is hyper-desire. Epithumia means hyper-desire. It's translated here, lust. And so when John speaks of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the word that's translated lust is almost always the Greek word epithumia in the New Testament. It's a hyper-desire. It's a burning desire. It's what consumes you. And John says, look, if your epithumia, if your hyper-desire in life is pleasure or if it's possessions, if it's all about you, then you're on a path of worldliness. It's a wide path that leads to destruction. It leads to hell. Now think about, with that in mind, think about what is celebrated the most in our culture today. Because I tend to think that nothing much has changed since John wrote these words. You think about the pleasure, the possessions, the pride. These are the things we put in lights. These are the things we elevate. This is the path that we are pointed to from the time we are young, this is what you should go after. In the movies, in music, in television, we give our attention to pleasure and possessions and pride. Think about pleasure. The food that you eat, the drinks that you have, and how that's, that's so ingrained as a part of our culture. If you have a hunger, you're satisfied. If you have a thirst, you're satisfied. Sexual pleasure, sex is the most searched word <coughs> on the internet by far. It's the theme of countless movies, books, songs, shows. And for many people, pleasure is their epithumia. It's their hyper desire in life. And what about possessions? We're exposed to some 4,000 advertisements every single day. And the not so subtle message in those advertisements is look, here's how you know you're on the right path. If you wear this and drive that, if you live here and vacation there, if you do those things, that's how you know your life is on the right path. And of course, all of this is rooted in pride, in this problem of self-centeredness, where my life becomes about making me happy and letting other people know how happy I am. It's about me being noticed. It's about me being recognized. It's about me having the nicest house and wearing the nicest clothes, me winning and me being right. And social media is fueled. Facebook, Instagram, those things exist because people have an outlet to say, look at 
me. It's, it's an attitude of pride that becomes all about self. And so John says, look, if that's the path you're on, if this is what you're pursuing with your time and with your money, would you please, John says, would you please stop calling yourself a Christian? Would you please stop calling yourself a follower of Jesus? If you're not following him, and you're instead following this path of worldliness, just stop identifying yourself as something that you aren't. Then he makes an argument against worldliness. Look at verse 17. He says, the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. These things, pleasure, possessions, pride, are not going to last. You're going down a dead end path if you choose this path of worldliness because the end of it leads to death. Not just your own physical death, but your spiritual death. It's going to end. The party's going to be over someday. He says the man who does the will of God will live forever. The man who chooses the narrow path is going to live forever. And so John mentions these two paths, and then he makes sure that the choice is clear, the path of Jesus or the path of worldliness. And then in the next section, he uses some even stronger language to convey these truths. Look at verse 18. He says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know that it's the last hour. John is the only writer of Scripture to use the word Antichrist. Now, we typically think of Antichrist as a capital A Antichrist. We typically think of the book of Revelation when we think of Antichrist. But that word Antichrist never appears not one time in the book of Revelation. It's found five times in Scripture, four times in 1 John, and once in 2 John. But people hear the word Antichrist and they think of some political figure, some person, some government that's going to appear at the end of time, giving an indication that the end is near. But John says here, writing in around 85 or 90 AD, that many Antichrists have already come. Then he goes on to explain. He goes on to specify maybe who some of these Antichrists are. He starts talking about some people who were a part of the church. They once identified themselves as followers of Jesus, but now they've kind of abandoned their faith, and they don't live in such a way that they're following Jesus. Look at verse 19. Speaking of these people, John says, they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. He says, if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But they're going. In other words, they're leaving their faith, show that none of them belong to us. But he says, but you, those of you who are faithful, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I don't write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Notice this. Who is the liar? He says, the liar is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Father. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son also has the Father. So these people who once called themselves Christians but left, John doesn't just call them sinners or backsliders. He calls them the Antichrist. He says they're Antichrist because they're denying the Son of God. Because what they're living for, the path that they're traveling, is the opposite direction of what Jesus has called them to. So he says, do not love this world. There is this story in the New Testament. It doesn't get a lot of mention, doesn't get a lot of uh, attention. There's a story in this New Testament, that we're really going to call it a story. There's a story in the New Testament about a man by the name of Demas, D-E-M-A-S. The Apostle Paul, when he was in prison in Rome the first time, he wrote some books in the New Testament, but he talked about this gentleman, this guy named Demas, who was there with him. And Demas was helping him and encouraging him. And that's really all we know about this guy named Demas. But then Paul is in prison in Rome again for the second time. And this is right before he is going to be killed. And the very last paragraph that the Apostle Paul would ever write in his life is the letter of 2 Timothy. And he writes to Timothy, who's kind of a partner of Demas, and he says this, Paul says this very quickly, a very short sentence. He says to Timothy, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. 
Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas's epithumia was the things of this world. Now, how does that happen to a church? How does that happen to a church? How does that happen to us? So I'm just going to tell you, there have been weeks, and if I'm really honest with you, there have been months in my life where my epithelia has not been with Jesus. It's been things for this world. And sometimes I don't even realize that it's happened until I look back. I was, I was reading some work recently about a guy named Donald Hoke. He was talking about this thing that probably a lot of you are familiar with called the Stockholm Syndrome. Something I've read about, but something that's interested me, kind of a fascinating thing. But you're probably familiar with the Stockholm Syndrome, at least to an extent. The FBI has analyzed literally hundreds of thousands of hostage situations. And what they found is there, there is this very common phenomenon known as the Stockholm Syndrome. It's where the hostage begins to develop affection and feelings for the person who has taken them hostage. And then they begin to transfer their hatred and their ill will toward those who are trying to rescue them. Now that term was originally coined in the year 1973. There was this man who went into rob a bank in Stockholm, Sweden, and the police came while he was there, and that bank robber took four people hostages, three women and one man, and he took them hostage for 131 hours. And while he had them as hostages, he absolutely terrified them. He fired his automatic weapon at them. He didn't hit any of them, but he scared them to death. He intimidated them. He put nooses around their necks and threatened to hang them. And when it was all over, he did not harm a single one of the hostages. But something very strange happened. The hostages ended up fearing the police more than they feared the man who had, had taken them hostage. They said they didn't hate the hostage taker. They refused, in fact, later to testify against him. One of the ladies that he took hostage later became engaged to him. Because somewhere in the midst of all of this emotion, in the midst of all of this adrenaline, what happened is those people started to confuse the enemy as a friend. And the friend, the rescuer, they saw as an oppressor. And I just see, I see that in my heart sometimes. I see that in the church. I see that in the church. A spiritual Stockholm syndrome. That maybe without even realizing it, we've begun to confuse the enemy as our friend. We've begun to think of our rescuer as being some kind of an oppressor. And so we're being held hostage by the things of this world. I know that sometimes when we are on the world's path, we get caught up in our epithemia. Our hyper desire becomes the pay raise. Our epithemia becomes the new house or the new SUV. Our epithemia becomes the relationship. It becomes the sports team. It becomes our children. It becomes our driving passion. And sometimes we are held hostage by these things. But Jesus has come to free. He has come to free us from our epithumia. Let me say that in a better way. It would be more correct to say that Jesus has come to be your epithumia. Jesus wants to be your hyper desire. He's come to be your driving passion. He has come to replace these things that we put on the throne of our hearts with himself. So that our greatest desire in life is, is him. And our greatest love is not the things of this world. It's not pleasure, it's not possessions, it's not self. That, that it's Him. It's interesting as we close. I was, I was doing a word study on this word epithumia this past week. And the times that it's found in the New Testament. And almost every time you come across the word epithumia in the New Testament, it's almost always in a negative context. It's speaking about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, desiring worldly things. But I found one place in Philippians chapter 1. 
where the word epithumia was used in a positive context. It's used differently. Paul's writing with Philippians. He's running to the church in Philippi from prison. He could be put to death, and he knows that. And so he's writing to them, and he's explaining to them this internal struggle that he has. The struggle was this. Is it better for me to stay here living on earth so that I could minister to you, or is it better for me to die and go be with Jesus? So he talks about this internal struggle, this battle that he's having on the inside. Here's how he describes it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. He says, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart to be with Christ, which is better by far. And that word desire in the Greek is the word epithumia. Paul says, my hyper desire of what I lust for, what I lust for is to be with Christ. He says, it's better by far. It's not this world. It's not the things that the world offers. It's to go and be with Christ in heaven. That, Paul said, is my epithemia. That's my hyper desire. And so that is our challenge and our prayer today. That we would just stop and consider and honestly say what path we are on. And if we are following down a path marked by worldliness, that we would repent of that, turn back, and ask Jesus to be our epithelium, to be our greatest desire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day of life that you have given each of us. For this opportunity that you have given us to again come here freely and to worship you. And Father, we've been challenged by John's words today to be honest and evaluate who is it that sits on the throne of our hearts. And Father, if we are honest and we determine that it's anything or anyone other than you, that we would repent, that we would turn to you, and that we would get back on this narrow path that is tough to travel. But Father, it's the path of your Son that it leads to eternal life. And so Father, if there's somebody here today that has never before made that decision to start on the narrow path, they've never given their life to Jesus the first time. Father, I pray during this time of invitation that they would come forward, confess their faith in Christ, repent of their sins, and be baptized. Father, accepting Jesus and his grace for the very first time and to begin traveling that narrow path that leads to you, that leads to life. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our song of invitation.
Thank you. 